today's edition, uh, we've got um, Mirza Yawar Beg, who is a leadership consultant, family business expert, uh, international traveler, globe trotter, and uh, he mixes Eastern uh, teachings with uh, Western business systems uh, for uh, holistic worldwide solutions. So we have uh, uh, his rich journey, which we shall be exploring today. Uh, in this talk and he has great lessons over his uh, uh, rich 35 year uh, consulting management consulting business consulting experience and uh, we shall uh, listen to uh, sir birza yawar bakes experience so over to you uh <laughs> Walk us through your journey. Uh, so I do see you have been a leadership consultant and um, family business uh, expert who advises business families on how to take uh, the business from point A to point B and so on. And that apart, you also mix, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, teachings uh, for a balanced world, uh, which combines the best of the East and the West. Uh, so how has uh, all of this started? So, uh, like, you know, how, how we focus through your journey? I would see that you also had a stint at uh, T Estate, uh, T Estates as your uh, in the starting of your career. Uh, so, uh, how was it? How did it all start? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dilakaran. First of all, for this opportunity to talk to you, and it's a wonderful opportunity. I'm honored that you consider me to be <laughs> worth talking to, and uh, it's a uh, it's a very nice opportunity. Um, now, question is, how far back do you want me to go? Because I am uh, on the 20th of October this year, I will be 65. So it's... Yeah, <laughs> it's probably a, you can uh, zip us through your journey, uh, the important milestones, and uh, especially the light bulb moment as to... Uh, you know, I also uh, chanced upon your uh, uh, videos on YouTube or probably your blogs where you said, I wanted to be a leadership consultant way back in the day even when you are not doing that as your profession, uh, like the primary bread and butter of your life. And so what made you trigger and take that uh, moment of uh, like, you know, how, how is that calling there so strong in you that you know you want to do, be a leadership consultant when uh, you had uh, nothing of that kind of background <laughs> to your backing. Uh, so you could walk us through the important milestones uh, which has taken you there. Okay, so I'm going to try and do a very quick thumbnail sketch of all that. Um, I was born in Hyderabad and I went to the Hyderabad public school uh, and then from there I went to, uh, I, I did my BA in history, political science and Urdu literature uh, from Usmania University. So that's uh, in, a, in, a, in a thumbnail in my childhood. The interesting, the important and interesting thing about my childhood was that we grew up in Hyderabad in a culture uh, which was so completely uh, eclectic and so completely inclusive uh, that uh, it's, uh, I'm sad to say, not uh, that common today. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to start off on a complaining note, but the, the, but the uh, for example, I mean, one of the things was that, um, you know, our friends who were there, the thing about, I, I will not say that, uh, most of our, most of our, uh, you know, a great many of my friends and my parents' friends uh, were not Muslim. They were, you know, Hindus and a couple of Christians. Uh, I won't say that because the reason I won't say that is because for us, the religion was never mentioned. Uh, nobody asked that question. You know, ni neither nobody asked, asked, and asked, asked that question, nor was that question asked or spoken of in our home. So that was the general, uh, very inclusive, very... Um, affectionate kind of uh, uh, atmosphere of uh, uh, in which I, I grew up uh, through my school and college and so on. Then I had an opportunity when I finished my college, I had an opportunity to go to Guyana, to South America. My father was a medical doctor and he was there on a, on a, uh, for a short assignment. So I went for a holiday and I stayed on in Guyana for five years and I lived in a place called Kukwani on the Burbis River. Uh, which was literally in the middle of the Amazonian rainforest. Oh. And I worked for a mining company. I worked for a bauxite mining company uh, for five years. Uh, in that process, I also set up a sawmill uh, to take care of the, you know, for, for bauxite mining, open cast mining, they literally cut down the forest and burn it. 
and then they dig up uh, they make literally open cast mining is a big hole in the ground so that's what they do uh, so i told my company why are we wasting the, the beautiful hardwood trees so i said why are we wasting that uh, why not uh, establish a sawmill and you know make uh, use that timber for something else so my boss a uh, man called nick adams he said you know what that's a brilliant idea excellent so go and do it um, so i said what about my job he said it's your idea so your job plus that to go do the go do both and uh, he didn't say that he's going to give me double the salary he never did so i for the same salary uh, i did two jobs and that was probably one of my first uh, within quotes informal leadership uh, lessons that if you want leadership you have to take it uh, it won't be offered to you on a plate you got to take it number one number two uh, since you want since you are the one who wants it you need to be able to pay for it meaning that i was they were they said happy go do it go ahead do the job set up the sawmill who is the boss of the sawmill you are the boss of the sawmill uh what about extra pay well what about it you know i mean we we didn't ask you to do that work so if you want to do the work go do the work so which means that the pay off from the leadership decision has to come from the decision itself you have to enjoy the journey you must love what you do so the money was not important uh, money is always important but the point is that i did not do that for the money because i never i didn't get one single a uh, guy and a dollar extra for that but i had a time of my life because i was doing a full time uh, my full time job as assistant administrative manager uh, and it was a mining town so the company owned everything in it and uh, which meant also that the company was responsible for everything if somebody's toilet got blocked it was the company's job if somebody's uh, you know electric power went down it was the company's job and meaning i had to do something about that so i had that job uh, including personnel uh, management including hiring uh, all that plus i had this i started off the sawmill so about, about 3 to 4 3 days in the in the week i would spend in the bush camping in the in the rainforest uh, and uh, other four days i would spend in the within town and if you if you look at kokwani it's uh, we are we are not looking at uh, mumbai or delhi you know it's, <laughs> it's a tiny little village in in our indian context it is a village it's not even a town so it's a village on the bank of this river in the middle of the forest anyway so that's what i did. i spent 5 year, five years there then i there yeah, i just got too lonely i mean it was um, you know it, it was good but uh, i also knew that guyana at that time uh, was a communist country uh, and uh, to get anywhere you needed political connections those i didn't have so i knew that this career was me. i mean the, the 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 present was very nice but the future wasn't going anywhere so i at the end of 5 years i returned i came back to india and that is where i joined the tea planting industry now tea planting again was a old love of mine <clears throat> thanks to thanks to one of my uh, very dearest very very dear friends who just passed away last year uh, from hyderabad nawab nazir yarzak and nawab nazir yarzak was a tea planter in the anamalis <clears throat> and um, he used to tell me stories about about his days in, in planting so uh, that was that that was the seeding of it so i loved planting i loved the idea of planting i hadn't, i hadn't a clue what it was but i loved the idea of planting and i loved planting in the anamalis so i to make a long story short by various means i got a job in the anamalis itself uh, where nab nazir azam used to work so it was a, it was a kind of dream dream come true kind of like have fun on the job <laughs> like you get to be paid to have fun on the job <laughs> have fun on the job i mean i i i think one, that's another if you want to say you know leadership learning which is that find a job which you would pay to do so oh. Yeah. So it's I mean it's like that. So it's uh, don't don't work for a salary. Uh, you find a job which if if you, if you had to pay to do that job, you would do it. And this is what this is where I was. I was in a. In the yeah, right actually, place. that that piece of advice is uh, really good for youngsters these days because they're always yeah. looking at what is it there for me if I get this? Okay, what is the monetary reward and so on? So that's really that nicely said. Yeah, the problem is that today we seem to translate everything into within quotes dollar value. but um, in my experience in life uh, anything which is valuable cannot be paid for in dollars meaning not just us currency i mean any currency right uh, anything like like friendship for like 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 you know the, the, the love of friends the respect you get in, uh, from people uh, you know the the, the, the warmth of a, of company uh, the taste of good food i mean this these are not things that you can pay for these are things you are, so in life also Uh, the secret of success and happiness in life is find something that you love to do then how much you get paid won't matter 
and uh, you will get paid. I mean, the, I always tell people the natural consequence of good work is good remuneration. They don't worry about that. You will get paid. If you are adding value to somebody, they will pay you, whether it's an employer, whether it's a, it's a client or whoever. So focus on adding value. Don't worry about how, how much am I getting paid. Focus on adding value. People will pay you. I have had, cli I have had clients, <clears throat> not too many, as a matter of fact, just two. But two of my clients, one of them, when I gave him my bill at the end of an assignment that I did, and this was in Bangalore, uh, he returned the bill. So I said, what happened? I, I'm, I'm sorry, is there a problem? He said, no, this bill is too less. He said, the kind of work you did for me, this is, non this is nonsense. So please, you know, uh, raise a higher bill. So I said, this is what I normally charge. He said, I don't care. I'm not paying this amount. You, you give me a bill for more money. So I gave him, he paid me. Another one in South Africa, I uh, did, a, did a job for them. I sent uh, the bill and they sent me back an amount which was 25% higher. So I said, I'm sorry, there seems to be a mistake in this uh, check you have sent me. It's uh, numbers. They said, no, no, no mistake. We, and he said, you know, I have given you 25% more. What you did was worth much more. But he was a Gujarati. He said, but I'm a Gujarati. So I'm, I'm giving you 25% more. So <laughs> <laughs> I also have to feel, feel good that I got a good bargain. So he said, even though what you did was worth much more than that, I'm giving you 25%. So I mean, this is, uh, the, if you do good, focus on the work, nothing else. And focus on doing something you enjoy. So that's why I joined planting. I was in, in tea for 10 years. And that is where now the question you asked me about the light, light bulb experience and so on. So I joined, I joined T in 1982. In 1983, I went to um, I went to Jaipur to participate in a uh, applied behavioral science program. Um, the uh, the institution was called the Indian Society for Applied Behavioral Science (ISAPS). So ISAPS had this program. I went to participate in that. There, I'm, I, uh, the facilitator, the trainer, the teacher was Mr. A.D. Joshi, Mr. Arun Joshi, uh, who's currently in, uh, he lives now in Pune, he's retired in Pune. So Arun Joshi was there, and I saw the work that Arun Joshi did, meaning on myself as well as the other people in the lab. And I saw how hugely impactful he was and how enormously his uh, facilitation and his teaching helped me. So I thought to myself that this is what I want to do. So Arun Joshi was the light bulb. I mean, Arun Joshi was my inspiration. So I said that this is what I want to do. This is what I want to spend my life doing. I want to do something where I'm helping people. And obviously Arun Joshi was enjoying what he was doing. So I said, here's the man, he's happy doing what he's doing. And it's also helping people. Uh, so he's, uh, he, he's on the sweet spot, you know, he's got, both, both ends uh, taken care of. So that is where the inspiration came. Then what I did was that um, ISAPS had this four-year internship program. Now, the way it was run, ISAPS was, a, was populated at that time anyway. Uh, the entire board was all professors, were all academicians. So these people, I mean, the, it, it was like a PhD program because they were from big universities. Uh, that, that was their framework. Gaurav uh, Chattopadhyay, uh, there was uh, Somna Chattopadhyay, uh, you know, all of these <laughs> big uh, Abad Ahmed and uh, Uday Parikh and Uday Parikh. Uh, so which university was this? Uh, CSAM. Uh, called the Indian Society for Applied Behavioral Science. Oh, okay. I, Does it still exist now? Yeah, yeah, very much is there. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's, like, it's, more, it's, more, it's more like, I mean, to give, in, to give you a, a comparison, it's more like the uh, Chartered Accountants Institute. It's not a okay. university. Okay. It's okay. a private body which uh, certifies you in a particular way of uh, training. And uh, I'm saying the rigor with which it was done, at least at that time, and thanks to the fact that uh, the board of it and the management of it was all these big time academicians, was that it was run like a PhD program. So it was like a four year PhD program. You had to write a thesis, you had, you had to do internship with people and reading and practice and logs and all kinds of stuff. So I did that. Now, the only, within quotes, sad part was that there was no PhD degree at the end of it, right? So I, I, I don't have, I can't call myself a doctor of whatever, uh, you know, applied behavioral science. But that doesn't matter. I mean, I, that's another thing of another one of my um, 
you know, call it what you want, leadership learning, which is that don't be focused on the on the pieces of paper. Don't be focused on the degrees and stuff. What matters is what you can actually do. What can you actually deliver? So the piece of paper means nothing. If you can't do it, if you can't deliver it, the paper is going to get you nowhere. At the most, the paper opens a door. Right? Somebody, it looks nice on your on your CV, but at the end of it, when you get into the organization, then you have to be able to show some results because just the, just to say, oh, I'm from the I'm Ahmedabad makes no difference. Uh, you may be from there, but you know, if you can't do my work, then I'm not impressed. So this is the that was the second part. So I did that. Um, and in 83, when I came back from ISABs, I wrote this, uh, this uh, goal for myself. And I said, I want to be a globally recognized leadership uh, consultant. So all of, all of this was, uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. all of this was while you're still in the tea plantation job? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And all okay. this was while I was still in the tea plantation job. And that was, uh, that was uh, you know, within quotes, uh, surprising for a lot of people, for, for me also in a way, I guess. Because I was, and think about it, I was in this job. The tea plantation job is a 24-hour job. It's, you know, we used to work 24-7 before they invented the term. Um, because we were, we, we, we had our, uh, you know, uh, eight, 10 hour work day, plus we were on call the rest of the time. So we were there 24 hours. Um, on top of that, locationally, I was in one of the most beautiful places on the, on the planet, but also one of the most inaccessible because the top of the animal is where I was. Uh, you had to go up 40 hairpin bends from, uh, Polachi. Uh, to get to the top there, and then you have to drive another one hour across to Shekel Mudi, where I was. So one of the most inaccessible. So now, when I decided that I want to be a leadership trainer, I said, what do I need to do? I, I need to learn how to do leadership training. So I said, okay, so who teaches that? Short answer, nobody. Is there a degree? Even shorter answer, no. Is there a degree even today? No. So what to do? I, what I had to do was effectively... Find people like Arun Joshi, like whoever, who were already in that work and say, please, can I come and sit in your class? Can I be a fly on the wall? Can I just come and sit in the class? Watch what you are doing, take notes. And then will you spend an hour with me, half an hour with me at the end of the, at the, end of the session? And we can uh, do some, uh, you know, uh, I, I, can, I can sort of feedback to me, uh, some debrief. Uh, so I understand some of the things you did, why you did that and so on and so forth. And then I go away and next morning I come back to your class. So many of them uh, were very kind. They said, yes, please do come. Now, what does that mean? It means that I pay for my transportation. I pay for my local, uh, you know, accommodation. I pay for my food or I fast, whatever the case might be. And I go to their class and I do, I am the, I am the go for kid in the class. If the teacher needs water, I go get the water. He wants tea, I go get the tea. I clean the blackboard. Those were, we didn't have a white, we didn't have white boards in those days. It was blackboard with chalk. Uh, or we had charts, uh, you know, chart papers and flip charts, right? Then came the, uh, you know, you remember, I'm sure uh, the, the, those uh, transparencies, which we would put on those uh, overhead projectors, right? Correct. So, uh, yeah. Long before laptops, I mean, what sat in your lap at that time was not a computer. So, I mean, the, the uh, things, uh, the, 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 I did all this. I have traveled third class train, uh, which means a plank, um, bus, regular uh, transport bus, not even a luxury bus. And I, uh, I've stayed, I've stayed in hotel rooms where you would not put your dog. I mean, such, and no reason. I mean, not that I loved that uh, hardship. It, that was all the money I had. I was earning in the, in the tea garden in those days. My, op, my starting salary was 850 rupees. Now, 850 rupees in 1982 was not equal to what it's today. I know it was worth more, but it was still not I was not a millionaire. It was 850 rupees and that went up to 1100 rupees. In um, 1993, I retired as uh, the, uh, the manager of uh, New Ambari Estates. I was effectively the general manager of two estates, three factories and a school. And my, my last salary was 5,000 rupees. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right? I mean, today, today you offer 5,000 rupees to a youngster, he'll think you are insulting him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so my my my, my in Hyderabad, my driver runs more than that. Believe me, I'm sorry. Correct, 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 correct. You get, you get more than double that. Anyway, that's that's not the point. The point I'm saying is that uh, <clears throat> so I was in this place when I decided. So I wrote these things. I want to be a globally recognized leadership uh, consultant. So I said, now how to do that? How to learn training? This is how. So I had a roster of uh, people 
who were willing to train me on which days they had their trainings in which cities and what not. So that was one. Second thing was to get leave because I was entitled to 30, 35 days of annual leave. That was it. Now, going somewhere on a weekend was, uh, first of all, I, I, was, I was on call. The tea, tea planting job, you're on call throughout. So there's no, you have to, even that weekend, you have to take it off. But even if I took it off, first of all, the weekend in those days was only one day because Saturday was a full working day, only Sunday. In one day to go and come back was impossible, physically impossible, right? I, if I had, unless I had a helicopter, which I didn't have. So it meant that if, that my time for learning had to come out of my annual vacation. So from 1983 to 1994, when I finally launched Yavar Begin Associates in Bangalore, I did not take a single day's vacation. Oh. Yeah, entire period, not one single day's vacation. Number one. Number two, all the extra money that I had, whatever was saved. Plus, I used to get uh, an annual travel uh, allowance, which was, at that time, it was first class train fare from Coimbatore to Hyderabad. That was my, my home thing. That amount of money, plus whatever I could save, entirely went in my traveling back and forth to wherever I was learning from. Right? So we had no television. We had no, no frills whatsoever. Now, thankfully, my wife is a huge, huge supporter of mine all the time from the day we got married in 1985. So throughout that period, she would go off to her parents' place. I would be, uh, I would be going, you know, shunting from this city to that city, uh, working with uh, different people. So this is what I did. That is how I got my, and then through that period was a four years of ISAPs um, of the Indian Society for Applied Behavioral Science. So in, uh, at the end of that four years in 1987, I got my ISAPs professional membership. So it's like the, like the CA getting qualified again. Oh. And what happened was that again in 83 uh, or 84, one of my very, very dear friends, uh, Pratik Roy, Mr. Pratik Roy, uh, he came to visit me. And uh, Pratik is a very dear friend of mine, and you know we 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 uh, we, we talk about uh, different things. So I, I told Pratik, I said, uh, you know, this is what I plan to do. Pratik said, you know what, that's a brilliant idea because this tea job anyway, one day you will retire, even if you finish, and then you will be sitting at a you know sitting at a loose end like most tea planters. Um, so instead of that, uh, now this is something you can do all your life. I said, true, that that's something that I want to do all my life. So he said, then you need an MBA. It is not because the MBA will do anything great for you, but because it looks good on your CV. So I said, from where? He said, only one place, IIM Ahmedabad. That is the number one uh, MBA college business school in the country. No point in getting it from a second rate place because it has, it has, anyway, it has no meaning, but second rate place, it has zero meaning. So get it from the number one place because it looks good on your CV. I said, okay, fantastic. So that was my next goal. Problem, MBA, PGDM is a two-year, full-time, two-year program. Correct. There's no way on earth that I could take two years off to go and do a PG, PGDM, number one. Number two, I needed the money. I needed my salary badly. So there was no way I could resign the job, go do a two-year two PGDM, then go look for another job. All this was not doable. So I said, now what to do? So I decided that I will find out. So I did some research. I found out that I am Ahmedabad at that time had the equivalent of an executive MBA, which they called the MEP, which was a five-month program. Now, the five-month program, was, but the, 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 the hours were grueling. It was five months of solid work, no holidays, not even festival holidays. And there was no Sundays, no nothing. They, 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 they taught you throughout. And the average uh, teaching hours uh, were about, uh, you know, between 14 to 16 hours a day, plus you had study. So I don't think in that five months that I slept for more than about three hours or four hours maximum on any night. And, so it, and was on, it was on campus? On campus, on campus full time. Oh, okay. And, uh, and many nights we didn't sleep at all. So I mean, many times we went 48 hours without sleep. Because the next day we had a we had a training program, uh, we we had a we had a class and we had a CP. We had a class presentation to make. There would be the the, the, the professor would you know take our pants off. So we had to be very very uh, you know clear. The the what I was looking for was what was the content of this MEP, and who was teaching it. 
And what I discovered, and that's what gave me a lot of satisfaction. One was the content was the complete PGDM syllabus. Number two was including all their case studies, everything, right? The, what they were teaching normally in two, in two years, they were teaching in five months. Second thing was all the professors were the same. Now, that was very good because I said, okay, we're getting the same quality of instruction. You're getting the same content. Uh, interestingly, the fee was also the same and that was 30,000 rupees in those days. Now, 30,000 rupees was 30,000 more than I had. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, it was an impossible number. So I said, okay, no problem. Uh, now what to do? So I went to my class. You know, you, this, this is the thing in, in terms of challenges. Take it one at a time. Number one. Number two, my principle in life, no does not mean no. No always means not yet or not in this way. Right? So we say, okay, I, I want to be a leadership consultant. How can I be? You can't be. Is there a training program? No. So what, what is that? Doesn't mean no. Doesn't mean it means there is no official formal training program. It doesn't mean you cannot learn. Right? Learning and having a degree are two different things. So in this case, I went to my company and I said, well, uh, this is the program, so on, so on, so on, blah, blah, blah. I will come back and I will be, you know, usually educated and so on. I'll, uh, you, they said, okay, fine. We heard all of this before. Now, what is it you want? He said, I want 30,000 rupees. I want you to sponsor me for this program. That's another learning. Always ask for the best. Don't, don't, don't uh, answer their questions before they ask the questions. Right. Because it is possible that somebody might say, you know what, you're a fantastic guy. You want to be sponsored. I think it's a great thing. We are sponsoring you. Goodbye. Now, please go ahead. Right. We, we, we pay for the whole thing. They could have said that. And if I had begun by saying, can I do this much that I would get less. So I said, no, I, can you do that? So they said, no, sorry, <clears throat> can't sponsor you. Now, there is a no. Did they say I can't go? No, they didn't say I can't go. They said they will not sponsor me. I said, OK, no problem. So you will not sponsor me. Can I go? They said, yeah, sure, you can go. I said, how can I go? It's five months. They said, number one, um, out of five months, one month, we'll take it out of your annual leave for that year. Other four months, leave without pay. Are you, are you willing? I'm already getting only 850 bucks, right? Leave without pay. I said, yes, I'm willing. So four months leave without pay, one month annual leave gone, right? That was one. Secondly, they said, I said, what about the fees? They said, what about it? I said, okay, so you're not going to give it to me. Will you give it to me as a loan? They said, sure, we'll give it to you as a loan, 8.3% interest. Pay it back and write a bond to say you will work for us for three years after you, after you return. So that meant that they saw value in what I was doing. Otherwise, why do they want me back for three years? So they saw <laughs> value in what I was doing. But they were not willing to pay for that. They said, okay, you are serious about it. You pay for it. I said, no problem. I said, very nice. So I went off. There was a test and whatnot. I passed that. I went off, uh, did that program. My wife went away to her parents' place. And in, that, in those days, her parents had moved to the UK. Okay. They had settled in the UK. So she went off to the UK. Now, what did that mean? That meant was, and you know what? Interestingly, the program started in April 1985. I got married in March 1985. So the program started one month after I got married. So one month after I got married, my wife was gone for five months and she went to the UK because that's where her parents were. And I did not even have the money to make an international call to speak to her. <laughs> before WhatsApp. <laughs> Those are the days before WhatsApp. Those are the days before Skype. You know, before this uh, Zoom, before nothing. So I didn't see her and I didn't speak to her for five months immediately after getting married, after one month. So I'm, I'm saying that if you want something in life, you have to pay. And many times the payment, the non-monetary payment is much more difficult than the monetary payment. True, true. Your partner to, it's very difficult to convince your partner to agree to your way of thinking. When somebody very, stepped in completely new. Very, I'm telling you, I, I, I'm hugely grateful for, for for the fact that I have a wife who, you know, she alhamdulillah, she understood everything and she was always and she continues to be very, very supportive. There's no way that I could have done what I what I did without that support. I mean, there absolutely no. I'm not being polite to some. This is the this is the truth. Then I came back, spent uh, another uh, three years, uh, and mostly I, I spent uh, about six years. So in 1993, 
uh, then I decided to leave planting. I left planting. I spent a year in Delhi. I was uh, uh, I was heading the uh, travel in inbound tourism business of uh, DHL, and then in 1994 I came and settled down uh, in Bangalore. The reason for Bangalore, I'm from Hyderabad. Uh, had settling down in Hyderabad would have been easier, but that's another leadership learning. Never take the easy choice. Always take the choice which is best for you, and then you know work hard to beat that. So I came and settled in Bangalore. Uh, because Bangalore was where the action was happening. Bangalore was where the multinational companies had come. Now, I don't know, the, the, the legend goes that uh, companies was, were uh, looking at Bangalore and Hyderabad. At Hyderabad, at that time, N.T. Ramarao was the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh. And N.T. Ramarao had brought in prohibition. So there was no liquor to sell in Hyderabad. And Bangalore had a, had a pub on every turn, every bed. And people say that that's the reason why multinational companies came there. I have no <laughs> no idea whether that is the actual reason or not, but that's where the MNCs were. Um, now, training, because leadership training, uh, in those days, I mean, you will laugh if I tell you the story, but in those days, if you went to an Indian business owner or an Indian CEO, and if you said to him, uh, I do leadership training, you know, I, uh, I'm in the business of leadership training, uh, I want to uh, train your people to be leaders. Uh, the standard answer was, we don't need leadership. Correct, absolutely. Union wale bahut hai. Humko nahi For them, leader was, they said, we don't need leaders. Because the leaders were people who were, they equated them with union leaders. Said, no, 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 we don't want union leaders. You are a troublemaker. We don't want you in, the, in our place. Right? So that was their standard thing. So I remember still, um, uh, one of the one of the business owners, he said to me, what will you teach them? So I said to him, I said, Unko kaam achha karna you know, I'll teach them to work uh, work better. He said, kaam to kar rahe. Isile to hum, hum unko pagar de rahe. He said, they are working. That's why we're paying them. Hey, well, what are you going to teach them? Right? And the whole idea of on-the-job training, of, of personal development was simply not there. Right? It simply didn't exist. Um, so people... If people actually, the language, people used to ask, how many hands work for you? This was language, this was actual standard, you know, people say, how many hands work for you? I, I have a job, I've got 200 hands working for me. I mean, hands, they didn't say 200 people working for me, 200 hands working for me. This was the language. So anyway, when the multinationals came, a lot of that changes, if not, changed, changed if not all, and a lot of the Indian companies also became very training and people development oriented. But originally it was, MNCs and a lot of the MNC training was they had standard courses back home in America or Europe or wherever and they just transported them in India. So in the beginning, they wanted Indians to run the same course, same content, including, believe me, when I first started working with GE, uh, even the posted pads used to come from the US. True, true. I think I could see that uh, your profile has MBTI training. Uh, so I think, uh, did it happen at the same time? Around this, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll tell you how that happened. So, okay. um, so the the companies came in. So they wanted people to do the. Basically, their their logic was was it was economic. If to fly in a trainer from the U.S. to do the training in India uh, was costing them a lot of money. So if we can find an Indian, you got Indians who are equally educated, who are who are you know <clears throat> English wise, they are perfectly perfectly fluent. So if you get an Indian trainer, then we are going to get the same training quality for maybe, you know, 150 at the cost or 100 at the cost. So that's what they did. Uh, I'm not going into all the, you know, things about, you know, pay, paying so much to them. For, for, somebody like, for somebody like me, that was an open door. So I did that. And the person who opened that door for me was Pratik Roy, because at that time, Pratik Roy was the training manager, uh, country training manager for GE. And uh, Pratik invited me. The first uh, GE program was he invited me. So I did this program. I was part of the training team in uh, Goa. It was a, a, a entry-level leadership program that GE ran from Grotteville, which is the GE University in uh, upstate New York, uh, in, in uh, White Plains area in New York. Now, that program was a five-day uh, program. It was called the LDC Leadership Development Course, and I was one of the training team there. Uh, on that training team was Carla Fisher, with whom I did the MBTI. So at that time, Carla Fisher was the MBTI trainer. I didn't know anything about MBTI, uh, but I helped her with that. Helped her meaning literally, 
we used to score the, the sheets were uh, on paper and uh, there was a template where you put it on the paper and you colored in the holes and that was that gave you the mbti score so i helped carla do that um, i also taught a leader uh, a, a uh, team building workshop in that course and a few other things so carla saw all of this and carla said would you like to be certified for the MBTI. So I said, sure, I'd love to do that. So she said that I'm going to sponsor you. Uh, GE will sponsor you to go to Fairfax, uh, Virginia, to Otto Krager Institute and get certified as an MBTI trainer. Once again, from their perspective, they had an MBTI. They would have an MBTI trainer in GE in, GE, in India, uh, which made sense for them. So I was flown out. Uh, GE paid for everything. They, they uh, took me to, to Fairfax, Virginia, and I got my MBTI uh, training and certification from there. Now, while I was there, Carla also said, uh, would you like to be certified on another GE training program uh, called the New Managers Development Course, NMDC, uh, which is in uh, GE Crotonville. So you go and audit the course, uh, sit there, uh, and they will certify you on the course. So now you can teach that course also in India and anywhere else in the world. So I said, fantastic, great opportunity. I said, sure, I'm going to do that. So I did my certification for MBTI. Then I went to Crotonville. That was my first time in Crotonville. Uh, I went to Crotonville. Uh, I audited the MBTI, the, the NMDC course, New Manager Development course. I met Jack Welch. Uh, and uh, he, he came to, one of the things in the, in the NMDC was addressed by the chairman. So Jack Welch came, he addressed the class. I was the class teacher at the time. So, so I, I had an opportunity to meet him and I didn't wash my hands for three days because, you know, Jack Welch had this hand, so this hand has got Jack Welch on it. <laughs> so I, I did that. And then I uh, went with the NMDC team to Atlanta uh, to teach the NMDC course in the US itself. So we ran the course, five day course. So five day course here, uh, auditing the course, learning the course, certifying, getting certified on it. Went to Atlanta, taught the course. Uh, it's a fantastic trip, beautiful trip. And huge learnings in terms of collegiate working, relationships, so on, so on. Huge learnings in terms of the difference in culture between uh, between America, between GE and India, and so on and so forth. Uh, wonderful. That's that's why I'm able to bring these two things together. I mean, my my uh, life of living in two worlds began with that. It's very, very, uh, very enlightening for me and very enjoyable for me. And then I returned to India. So this is uh, this is where it started. And then of course uh, we started this company in Bangalore, Yavar Begin Associates. First year was very, very tough because, you know, I came from a manufacturing background, from tea gardens, uh, mining industry, whatnot. I know how to drive a bulldozer. I know how to drive a front end loader. Uh, I can climb trees. I can dig holes. I can, I can run a tea garden. Uh, but I have zero contacts. And at that time, now I have huge contacts. But in those days, I had zero contacts in HR, in training, uh, in the corporate world. I knew nobody, right? And uh, so even my, a lot of my friends, they told me, you are mad. I mean, there's, how will you get, you don't know anyone in, the, in, this, in this whole thing. I, yeah, said, I don't know. At that time, there was not even any social media also. Like you can't uh, put an ad, you can't run a Facebook thing, nothing. Yeah. Nothing, nothing. There was no social media, no LinkedIn, no nothing. Right? Yeah, it's so almost you difficult. If you don't have contact, contacts, you're almost not in business. <laughs> yeah, almost not in, yeah, exactly. All not in business. Right? Um, so I, the, the interesting thing was, but as I, you know, I, I, tell, I always tell myself, if you, if you do what you do and you love doing it and you do it well, doors always open. My first, my first, literally my first assignment in Bangalore was in, in a company, uh, which was a European uh, IT hardware company. Uh, it was run by a, uh, by a Indian CEO, uh, whose only name was India, right? Uh, he was born, brought up, grew up, everything in the US. So he was in, the, he was in this company. Now the, the issue was the, the head of training and the head of HR actually of that company was, a, was, was somebody I knew. Uh, so he told me, you know, our, our CEO is having a lot of trouble with his direct reports. So I said, what happened? He said, you know, let, just to put it in one line, we have an American in an Indian skin. That's the problem, right? So he looks Indian, but he is American. They think he is Indian, and there is a huge. And he says, "Really, we don't know what to do." So, can you come and help us? So I said, "Okay." So I went there, 
um, I had a nice big long meeting with him, and uh, at the end of the meeting, I said to him two things. I said, number one, I want to sit in one of your meetings to see what is going on. I said, I've heard, I've heard you talk about it. I've heard your head head of HR talk about it. Thank you for the information, but I want to make my own assessment. So, can I sit in your meeting? Uh, to see what so this is, uh, just interrupt you uh, this yeah. is not done even today like they would never allow a trainer to get into and understand the organization <laughs> politics <laughs> they will not, but I think and you dare do it at that time <laughs> yeah this is the whole thing i always tell people forget the rules you can get what you can convince people to do simple as that true, right? true. So life is not fair i said life is never fair Right? You will get what you can negotiate. You get what you negotiate. You get what you can what you can convince. So I told him, I said, I said, if you want me to give you a good solution, I let me sit there. I will do it. And it's a mark. I mean, I'm, I'm very, I'm most grateful to God and to everybody else. You know, I, even despite that, now I'm asking him to sit. In, I'm asking him to allow me to sit into one of his. And he, this is a top board, not one one step short of the board meeting. It's like the internal board meeting. It's all his heads, all the VPs, right? Now, the point is, is not only he has to accept me, they all have to accept me being there, number one. Number two, they are not, they are going to have the normal discussion. So I am now an outsider and I am within quotes privy to whatever they are discussing there. They did not even ask me to sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, nothing. There was complete trust that you are here and we trust you. And without even saying that, I didn't tell them that, they didn't tell me that. Whatever reason, they decided to believe me, I decided to believe them and that trust I have kept throughout my life. And I always do. So anyway, I sat in the meeting and I realized what was happening. Just to give you a thing, they were discussing a matter of some financial thing which they needed to do. The head of finance, he said, sir, I think this is what we need to do. Now this uh, CEO, he slams his hand on the table. He said, fantastic, brilliant idea, excellent idea. Then he says, okay, what about the others? Can I have some more ideas? Now there is dead silence. Dead, nobody will say a word, dead silence. So I knew instantly what was happening. Now I saw him getting now, getting agitated. He, he was getting like, you know, come on, man. I mean, you know, I'm asking you, tell me. I said, look, can we take a break? I said, can we go, can we go have some coffee? He said, okay. Now it was like a lifesaver for him, you know, I said, okay, because this is getting too bad. As soon as we went out, I, I pulled him aside into a room. I said, did, I said, did you see what you did? He said, what did I do? What? I said, I'm, I'm only trying to be good. I said, no, 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 hold on a second. I said, you as the CEO, when one man gives you a, the finance guy gives you an idea. I said, very nice. You approved of the idea. But the way you approved that, you put such a stamp on it. Now, who wants to go and give an idea, which is more than likely going to be less than that? They don't want to look bad. So what happened? You, you already said fantastic. He said, yeah, but you know, in America, we say fantastic. I say, yeah, in America, you say fantastic. In India, we don't say fantastic. In India, we do not say fantastic unless it is super fantastic. Right? True. So his style of leadership was not collaborative. He is not that taking people along. Not taking along. So I, he said, okay, so he said, what to do? I told him, I, I want to run a three day. In those days, we used to run three to five day program. I said, I want to run a three day residential program for uh, for your team so you plus those guys right he said okay great that way he was agreeable because he was used to the american system so he said no problem we will agree we do that uh, what will you charge in those days i was charging 500 rupees per day but right? uh, sir that, one sorry to interrupt you how did you get to know this person actually how did you come across him him i came across through another friend of mine uh, you know socially uh, there was a friend of mine in, in bangalore so he told me, he's working for them. So he said, you know, this is what's happened. So it was a very informal uh, kind of uh, kind of introduction. So anyway, I was charging 500 rupees. So he told me, he asked me, he said, tell me, how do I know this will work? I said, you know what? Even I don't know if it will work. But we will try. So he said, you want me to risk? I said, yes. And I'll tell you what I want you to do. I said, I want you to risk. If it doesn't work, if you don't like the program, pay me nothing, right? So that is my deal. So I'm charging you this, but I will not give you an invoice now. I'll give you an invoice at the end of the program. If the program, if you don't like the program, if you think it didn't work, then charge me nothing. And then I will not charge you. So it, it's free, right? So you just had three days, call it a holiday, whatever, that's it. 
He said, if it works, I said, if it works, then I want you to, I want you to do two things. He said, what? I said, I want you to pay my fees. And I want you to pick up your phone and call your friends and tell them that here is this guy in the market, use him. So, <laughs> that is something nobody ever asked him before in his life. You know, he told me later on, he said, you know, no one ever asked me this in my life. I said, yeah, because I need it. I have no contacts. I have no network. I need somebody to be my ambassador. And who better than you as the CEO of this company? You, you are in the top of the top, right? So if you are going to pick up the phone and call someone and say, you know what, Yavar Beg is here in the market. We used him. We love him. Brilliant guy. Fantastic. Hire him. I am hired already. Correct, correct. He said, okay, deal. We never looked back. And he was good for his word. Believe me, I mean, that was man. I, he's, I, you know, he's a wonderful guy. He, he was good for his word. He picked up the phone. He called the head of Wipro in those days. Wipro was anyone in IT in Bangalore went through Wipro at some point in time. He was a doorman or he was the, he was a tea maker. He was whatever he was. You know, everyone. <laughs> Wipro is the, is the mother lord of all IT people in Bangalore, right? So he, for, he called Wipro. He called Infosys. He called all kinds of companies. And you know, he's talking to the top people. Right. He's talking to the CEO or the next level. He's talking to the head of VP or VP of, of, of training or HR. He opened doors for me. That was fabulous. The second client I had was a, was an Australian company. It was an Australian bank, which was doing IT support work back in Bangalore. Now that was an interesting thing because I joined in Bangalore. I joined an Aikido class. You know, the Aikido, the, 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 the Japanese. Uh, martial art. Yeah. Okay. So I joined an Aikido class. The trainer was an Australian guy called Julius Abe. So Julius Abe was my sensei. And Julius and I became very good friends. So Julius said to me, he, and Julius was working for this company. So Julius was an IT guy. He was an IT guy. He was working for this. So Julius said to me, you know what? I want to develop a, a, tra a program which has an IT component and it has a leadership component. We want to put this together. And uh, we want to call it, uh, you know, so leadership for uh, IT professionals or leadership for IT managers or something like this, so whatever title. So he said, we want to put these two together. I want us to do this together. You do the leadership piece. I do the IT piece. Uh, and those days we used to do Microsoft Workbench, which was the, which was the platform they're using. So he said, we put these two together. Um, so I said, sure, fantastic, let's do it. He said, no, 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 hold on. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a catch. I said, what's the catch? The catch is my CEO. He said, my CEO, he's Australian. He is one of the most cranky human beings you can ever find in, the, in, in your life. Um, he, if he says yes, it will happen. If he says no, then you can go and, you know, that's it. End of the story. Uh, he's got a very, very short fuse. He's got, he's very impatient. So he's got all of these problems. So I said, what's his number? So, <laughs> so I said, okay, yeah, here is his number. So he gave me, he gave me his phone number. I called him. Uh, he said, yes. I said, I would like to have five minutes. I said, I would like to have an interview with you. I want to present to you the work I do. I'm a leadership consultant. He tells me, will five minutes do? You know, will five minutes? I mean, if somebody is saying something like that to you, it's like an insult, right? Will yeah, I think I just uh, saw you also talk about the famous elevator pitch. Uh, so yeah. uh, the importance of elevator pitch. <laughs> so Absolutely. I think <laughs> that, that five minutes was. So you have to convince him in five minutes now. <laughs> and and this was before I even I even heard the term elevator. I didn't even know what. <laughs> elevator was. So it's five minutes do. And my principle in life is whatever the client tells you, as long as it is not illegal or immoral, you say yes. So he said, "Will five minutes do?" I said, "Yes." He said, "He said 11 a.m. tomorrow." I said, "Fine." So 10 to 11, I was in his office, I waited exactly 11 a.m. I'm sitting in front of him at five minutes, clock is ticking. I started speaking. I spoke for exactly four minutes. I said, I am done. Thank you very much. And I made to go. He said, no, 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 sit, sit, sit. And we spoke for 45 minutes. Oh, lovely. Right? True, so, yeah. <laughs> that, that's how good your elevator pitch was. <laughs> <laughs> that's how good it was. And, and it was completely, you know, that's what I'm saying. When I talk elevator speech, I'm talking from what I did and how it worked for me. True, true. I Straight from the heart. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my second client. So this is how we, this is how we start going. Business. But that one year was very, very difficult because in that one year, some there were times I, I, I as you as I mentioned the other day I, I we took a flat in Jamal extension. Uh, this was a 
this was a, a building uh, called uh, rock cliff and uh, in jamal uh, extension uh, there is a park in the center and uh, right adjacent to the park there is a canra bank and this building is is behind uh, canra bank so it's a very nice location and all that the rent of the flat in those days was 7000 rupees it is 1994 quite high yeah yeah. yeah, quite high, quite high, but it was a it was a very nice location. So we went and uh, we stayed there. In that first year, believe it or not, Sudhakaran, there were times when three to four days before the rent was due, I had no money in the bank. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> bank, bank balance was maybe God knows, 100 rupees or something. But by the grace of God, when I needed it, it came. We never defaulted on any payment. Uh, but things were that tough. I was so, traveling. Uh, that was your office come residence or only the office? Office come residence. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. That, that's another thing I. That's another thing I learned in in life is keep your overheads as low as you can. <clears throat> My business entirely is in the client's premises, so I don't need an office. True. I do not have any walking clients. So why must I pay office rent and why must I have a secretary and why, you know I don't need. So I never had any of those. Um, I I have no accounts person. I have no finance. I have a, a very uh, he, he is an accountant in Bangalore, but also is a very dear friend of mine, and he's been my accountant from 1994 onwards. Um, SVR Associates, brilliant people, fantastic job they do. What we do is at the end of the year, we put all the vouchers into a box and we ship it to SVR Associates with the invoices for the year with the bank statements and they do the entire uh, bookkeeping and they file the tax and they give me uh, the five, five tax return. They charge me one fee at the end of the year. That's it period. So I don't have to have an accountant. I don't have to have anything. I, my accounts are on, on top. My income tax is paid. Everything is done. Zero overheads. Now that's very, lean, very, very lean and mean uh, managerial setup. Very lean, and, right, very lean and mean. Just do what is necessary. Have expenses and what is necessary. You can live a nice lifestyle and you don't need to work that hard and you don't need to earn that much to have the same lifestyle. So that's one. Second thing is, because this is the upside, which is that, you know, I, I work from my place, but also it meant that I was my traveling. There were months in those days, there were months where I would be on the road for 22, 23, 24 days every month. So my wife was alone in Bangalore in the flat for 23, 24 days in the whole month, right? So we had a, we had a dog in those days. We had a, a Doberman, uh, a female Doberman called Bonnie. And so Bonnie and my wife, this was, <laughs> so we had, uh, you know, that was, they were with, in, in some ways tough, but also believe me, that was huge learning, enormous learning in terms of uh, entrepreneurship, in terms of start business startup, in terms of clients. In, and one of the big things I did was, and this is what I, the other day you asked me, how do you write so many books? Because I am a, I'm a huge believer in documentation. So I write down everything, right? This, my first meeting, I wrote it down. My first meeting with a client, I told you the whole story, I wrote it down. My second meeting with that, I wrote every single thing I used to write. I maintain a log, I used to write, this is the meeting, I went here, I did this, I did that, did it, throughout the thing. And then when I need now material for a book, it's already there. So all I need to do is to take it out and then to do some more research, to if I need some other outside information, put all that together. I think I just, uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. I also read about your Annamarai blogs, the TA State blogs. So was it also part of your journaling or uh, daily uh, diary stuff? You know, that was not so much part of that. that because it is in very great detail. I was wondering how can a person recollect that amount of detail <laughs> to yeah, a dot no, and a T. All, I mean, by the grace of God, I have a, I have a good mind. So it's <laughs> because you have put in a whole lot of information, which is yeah. years back, uh, yeah. quite commendable. <clears throat> yeah, that's, it. that is all, that's all memory. Those days I, I wasn't writing. I mean, I was writing some, but I, mean, I wasn't writing that stuff. I was writing more of the training stuff. Now, another interesting thing uh, in this Bangalore period, was again, uh, I mean, obviously, I, as you can see, I'm not naming any companies for obvious reasons. But one of the things which happened was that I, um, as I told you, that, that first year was very difficult financially, a very, very testing period. And I was getting job offers. 
because one of the things that happened with uh, with many of these clients was that they liked the work, so they said, "No, come work for us. That we give you a job." Now, for somebody who's struggling to get seven thousand rupees to pay his house rent, uh, in those days, I was I was offered a salary of fifty thousand rupees a month. Now that was like like the you know the mood. But I decided, no, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm on my own. I don't work for anybody. Period. So I don't. And if I if I'm starving, I have to go with a begging bowl on the street. Then maybe I look for it. But the, un, unless the, I do that, I will not. So I refused the job, including GE. In GE, I was actually interviewed uh, uh, in, in uh, by 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 the head of training for Asia. She was there in this uh, training program. Uh, she saw me. She said, "Would you like to work for GE?" So I said, "No, I don't think so." She said, I, "She said, tell, tell, let, let me let me suggest to you." She said, "Let me interview you." Right, so you get a GE interview. So it can't, it can't, you know, it 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 will help you anyway because you know it's a GE interview, GE interview. So you get experience of being interviewed by GE. Uh, then you can decide. I said okay. So she um, interviewed me, you know, for one and a half hours, uh, behavioral interviewing. Eventually, I ended up writing a book on behavioral interviewing. Uh, I, I have a book called Hiring Winners, which is a book on behavioral interviewing. So that that the, the genesis of that is my own interview. So she did that. Uh, at the end of that, she said, "You have the job if you want the job." So tell me, do you want the job? Um, so I said, uh, "I if I tell you no, right? I don't want you to be offended. But if I tell you no, what will you say?" She said, "If you tell me no, then I will tell you that that decision is the right decision for you." So I said, "This is strange. I mean, you are offering me a job." And if I'm refusing it, you're telling me the right. He said because you are an entrepreneur. She said that also I realized in my in my interviewing you. She said I realized that you are an entrepreneur. You like freedom. You like to do your own decision making. You like risk. He said it. She said it would be a pity to uh, to to tie that down to one Const company. Constrain somebody who loves that amount of freedom, which you can never get back. Correct. And second thing is, she said to me, which is a wonderful thing. She said, you know, she said your principal value is the variety you bring. So no matter which company you work for, you will then be constrained because you can only work for that company. He said today you work for IBM, you work for Microsoft, and those that are working. He said you work for IBM, Microsoft, you're working for big Indian Indian names, you're working for GE. When you come to any of us. You are bringing the sum total of G plus IBM plus plus Microsoft plus uh, Tata plus this one, this one. She said you cannot do that if you are working for any one of us. So that is your your your, your big uh, you know this is your 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 USP. So she said I would not. Uh, I think that's a good decision. So I never did. So I, I was offered jobs, but so in that time what happened was that I was called by a very big uh, IT firm, one of the big top two threes in, in Bangalore. The training manager called me and said, "We want you to do a training program uh, for our uh, for our middle management people, in which which includes MBTI. Because I was one of like three four MBTI consultants in Bangalore, so MBTI became a very big uh, USP for me. That right? anyone wanted MBTI in Bangalore, I was the only guy uh, to go to at at one point in time. Even now, there aren't too many MBTIs actually. Even now, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's no, not too many. Yeah." yeah. Not a, it's not a very common thing. Anyway, so I went. I gave her. A, it was a. It was a two-day program. I gave her the design, everything else, uh, all fine. Fees, how much, so much, everything. <clears throat> I went home. I did all the preparation. Those days, the training manuals. You had to go. You had to type out everything, format it, then take, then take it to the, uh, to the printer, photocopier. I, I, again, everything I used to outsource. I, I didn't have a printer at home. I didn't have a photocopier at home. I said. There's a guy who does a brilliant job. Give the give the work to him. So I used to do that. I did. I had everything ready. Then she calls me and says, "Can you please come and see us?" Uh, and it's like three days before the program. I said, "What happened?" She said, "No, no, please come." I said, "Okay." So I went to her office. She tells me, "Yavar, um, can you photocopy the MBTI instrument?" And so I kind of looked at her and my jaw dropped. She said, uh, "No, no, think about it." I said, "No, no, I would not. I, I, I'm sorry. There's nothing to think about. Uh, I'm just looking at you because you work for this company, which talks so much about integrity and honesty and blah blah blah." I said, "You know perfectly well 
as a at the as the head of trading and as an HR person that what you are asking me to do is illegal because MBTI is a copyrighted instrument. They will not even sell you the instrument unless you give them the the the, the qualifying name and the and the number uh, of the MB, MBTI consultant. They won't even sell you the instrument. You want me to photocopy and use that? I said, you know, this is illegal. You asking me to do that? She said, you know, it makes a big cost difference. I said, I know that. I know that. I said, you should decide. I said, I tell you what. Why don't I use some other instrument, which is a which is a copyright free instrument? Right? You won't get MBTI, but you know whatever results you want. She said, no, no, no. We want the MBTI. I said, fantastic. So get the MBTI. She said, no, no, no. But then she said, you know what? This is India, and you know many people do it. I said, you know what? You are an Indian. I'm an Indian. I'm sorry. I don't want to be identified as an Indian being a thief. You are. You are telling me. You are saying this is India, so stealing is normal. Because there are so many other Indians who are stealing. Why don't you be one of them? And I'm. I'm recommending that. I said, this is what you are saying. I said, I'm sorry. I find this insulting. Right? I'm Indian. I'm not a thief. I will not steal. She said, you know, don't get angry and all that. But you know, the, the business we are giving you 200 people. Uh, you know, you need the money. I said, yeah, I know, I need the money more than you know, I need the money. So I think you stood your ground, and uh, that was a question of ethics. She said, she said, if you if you don't agree, I'm sorry, we may have to cancel the course. I said, go ahead, and they cancelled the course. Oh, okay. They cancelled the course. So I lost money even in terms of the photocopying stuff. You know, I mean, in today's terms, that might not sound like much, but when you are strapped like the way I was strapped in those days. I I totally understand, yeah, the amount of time, energy that you spent, yeah. Yeah, but I said, I am not going to do something which is illegal. And I have never done it. I've never done it. And by the grace of God, this is this really worked for me because, you know, apart from anything else, I got a name for that. People said, no, 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 the, we don't even ask this guy because he will not do it. He, the, the, uh, for me, the biggest certification was the MBTI um, uh, agent who used to sell, the company used to sell, what, the, the head of that was a man called Mr. Ojha. So another client of mine one day tells me, um, you want to do the MBTI, and they wanted to, they wanted to do that properly. So uh, I said, buy, buy the stuff from this. I said, this is the these are the people who will sell it to you. Buy them. We finished the phone conversation. Then I and I forgot to give her the HR person. I forgot to give her my uh, my, my MBTI consultant number, which I, which the the other one, the, the client, the, the seller would have asked her for. Without the number, they wouldn't have sold her this. I forgot completely about that. And then when I went to the uh, prayer place, I then suddenly remembered, oh my God, I didn't give them number. So I called, I said, I tell you what, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to give you the consultant number. Uh, so, uh, and I'm sorry, it's delayed. Uh, what happened? She said, no, no, don't worry. They, 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 they sold us the thing. I said, how did they do that? She said, because I told them your name. They said, we know him, no problem. We are selling. Now, that is, to me, that was a very, very big, you know, uh, validation of your principles and everything. So this is uh, this is what I did, and then it's uh, it, it continued in twenty in uh, nineteen ninety seven. Then, so how how was this uh, typically? Your uh, was it all by word of mouth? Like you know, one client refers them. Uh, I mean, how how did your uh, pipeline of clients come along? Very very good question. Absolutely hundred percent word of mouth. Uh, until today. Oh, okay. Fine. And um, uh, in the early days, it was word of mouth in two ways. One was client refers to client. Second was clients gave me leads or employees or my people who came to the program, they gave me leads. They said, you know what? We know so-and-so. They need the program. And then in those days, there was a company called Digital. Um, so they said, you know, Digital needs a program. Why don't you go and, and meet Digital? So I would say, well, you know, who is there in Digital? So in digital those days, there was a man called Yuji Shekhar, who's another Shekhar, a dear friend of mine. He said, go meet Mr. Yuji Shekhar. So I went. Now, first time, I don't know Shekhar from anybody else. I go meet him and talk to him and so on. That's all. So there are two kinds of leads. One was the client referring the referring to directly to another client. Another one was leads. But over the years, quite literally, I think uh, almost for the last maybe 20 years, um, I have never done a cold call. Ever. I never had to do a cold call, and I, I mean, I mean, you know, it's all 100% client client referrals by the grace of God. People 
uh, and now of course we have a website and so on and so forth. But irrespective of that, it's all client referrals, and client referrals are the best because you know the the the, the trust begins from the word go. So one client is referring to another client, so they already have a uh, a trust base on on which it works. And then of course at the end of the day, I mean, at the end of the day, quality of your work, there's nothing to replace that. Whether it's a client referral, whether it is uh, LinkedIn, whether it is social media, whatever. At the at best, it opens a door, which is very important. You need the door to be open, but that does not mean that you are going to get client satisfaction directly because of that. No, client Good satisfaction true. depends on your own work, and that uh, that has to continue. Very true. I think uh, that's fantastic. So. <laughs>